Okay, let's talk about explainable machine learning. So far, we have trained many, many models. We have trained a model for image recognition. Give it a picture. It will give you the answer. But we are not satisfied with this. Next, we want the machine to give us the reason it gets the answer. This is explainable machine learning. Okay, before start introducing the technology, we need to talk about why explainable machine learning is an important issue. I think the essential reason is even if the machine can get the correct answer today, it does not mean it must be very smart. As an example, there used to be a horse that was very smart. So everyone called it the God Horse Hans. What could this God Horse Hans do? It could do math problems. For example, you asked what the root of 9 was. Then it started to calculate the answer. How did it tell you its answer? It would stomp the floor with its horse hooves. So if the answer was 3, it knocked 3 times. Then stopped. Which meant it got the correct answer. Then the people next to it would cheer for it. So this was the God Horse Hans. Then a bunch of people watched it solve math problems. Later, someone was very skeptical and asked why Hans could solve mathematical problems. It's just a horse. Why could it understand mathematical problems? Later someone found out that as long as no one was watching, Hans would not be able to answer math problems. When no one looked at it and you asked it a mathematical question, it would keep knocking its horseshoes. It didn't know when to stop. So it actually only detected the subtle emotional changes of the human next to him to know when it's going to stop stomping horseshoes so that it got carrots to eat. It's not really learning to solve mathematical problems. Today, we see various applications of artificial intelligence. Is it possible to be in the same situation as the god horse Hans? Today, in many real applications, explainable machine learning, explainable models are often necessary. For example, the banks may use machine learning models today to determine whether to lend to a certain customer. But according to the law, to use machine learning models to make automatic judgments, it must give a reason. So this time, we don't just train machine learning models. We also need machine learning models to be explainable. Machine learning will also be used for medical diagnosis. But medical diagnosis is a matter of life. If the machine learning model is just a black box, without giving a reason for the diagnosis, then how do we believe it is correct? Today, some people want to apply machine learning models to the law. For example, to help the judge decide the case. To help the judge decide the case automatically that can a prisoner be released on parole or not? But how do we know that the machine learning model is fair? How do we know that when it is making judgments, there are no other problems such as racial discrimination? So we hope that the machine learning model not only can provide answers, but also can give us a reason for the answer. One step further, self-driving cars may run all over the street in the future. When the self-driving car suddenly stops today, even causing injuries to passengers in the car. Is there any problem with this self-driving car? It may depend on the reason for the sudden stop. If it sees an old lady crossing the road, so it stops, then maybe self-driving is right. But suppose it's just for no reason. It suddenly goes crazy and wants to stop quickly. Then there is a problem with this model. So for self-driving cars, various behaviors and various decisions, we want to know the reason behind the decision. Go further. If the machine learning model has explanatory power, then in the future, we can rely on the result of the explanation to modify our model. Today, when using these deep learning techniques, the situation is often like this. Someone says that this is your machine learning system. Yes, I just throw the data into it. There is a multiplication of many matrices. Next, it will come up with the results. If the result is not as expected, what to do? Now, everyone knows, adjusting the hyperparameters, right? Changing the learning rate, right? Adjusting the architecture of the network, right? You don't know what you are doing, right? Just adjust the network architecture. I just mess this bunch of math, this bunch of linear algebra up again, and see if the result is better. Then others who have not done deep learning will be surprised. How can this be done? But in fact, for today's deep learning model, to improve the model, you need to adjust some hyperparameters. But we look forward to the future. When the deep learning model makes mistakes, we know where the mistakes are. 
We know why it makes mistakes. Maybe we can have a better way. A more efficient way. To improve my model. Of course, this is the future goal. We want to use. Explainable machine learning to improve model. There is still a long way to go. Some people might say that. We are so concerned about. Explainable machine learning today. Deep neural network. Maybe it's because. Itself is a black box. Can we use other. Machine learning models? If you don't use deep learning models. Use other models that are easier to interpret. Do we need to study. Explainable machine learning? For example. Suppose we use linear model. Its interpretation ability. Is relatively strong. We can easily know what. The linear model is doing. Based on the weight. Of each feature in a linear model. After training your linear model. You can know. How the model generates its result. The biggest problem with the linear model is that. It is not very powerful. We told you in the first class that. The linear model has huge limitations. We quickly go to the deep model. But the drawback of the deep model is that. It is not easy to explain. Everyone knows deep neural network. Is a black box. It's hard for us to know. What happened inside the black box. Although deep model is better than linear model. Its interpretation ability. Is far worse than linear model. Many people will. Come to a conclusion. You may often hear the idea that. We shouldn't use deep model. We should not use these more powerful models. Because they are black boxes. In my opinion. This kind of thinking is actually to cut the feet and fit the shoes. Do we discard. A very powerful model. Because it is not easy to explain. Shouldn't we think of ways. To make it interpretable. I heard a story told by Jan LeCun. This is from Jan LeCun. This is an old story. Everyone has heard of it. There is a drunk. Who is looking for the key under the street light. Everyone asked him. If his key fell under the street light. He said it wasn't. Because there was light here. So we insist on using. Simple but easily explainable models. It's like we insist on. Finding the key. Under the street light. We insist on using. More interpretable models. Although it's not good. We still insist on using it. It's like you must find the key under the street light. You will never find a powerful model. The powerful model may be. Outside the scope of the street light. What we have to do now is. To change the range of street lights. Can we change the direction of lighting. And make these more powerful models. To be placed under street lights. Make the powerful model. More interpretable. More explainable. Actually interpretable and explainable. Although the terms interpretable and explainable. Are often used alternatively in the literature. They are slightly different. Explainable usually refers to. Giving the original black box model. The ability to explain. This is called explainable. Interpretable usually refers to. A model is not a black box. Someone has digged into this model. It is not a black box at all. We have already understood its content. This is called interpretable. However, these two are mixed used in the literature. So we don't overemphasize. The difference between explainable and interpretable. Speak of both interpretable and powerful model. Isn't decision tree. A good choice? Decision tree is a more powerful model. Compared to linear model. Another benefit of. Decision tree is that. It is very interpretable. It is straightforward. When looking at the structure of a decision tree. We can know how every branch. Affects the final decision. We are not going to talk about. The decision tree in this course. Even if you are not familiar with the decision tree. It's not hard. For you to imagine. How decision tree works. We have a lot of nodes on tree. Each node will ask a question. And. Then decide to go left or right. Answer all of the questions. You walk to the leaf node. And make the final decision. You can trace through. All questions and answers. You can know. Why the model makes this decision. What kind of characteristics. Lead to the final decision. From this perspective. The decision tree. Is both powerful and interpretable. So this lecture can stop right here. With the conclusion that a decision tree is all you need. The end. Well, but is a decision tree all we need? Think about it again. Decision trees can also be very complicated. For example, I found someone asked a question. On the internet, he said he has such a complicated decision tree. That he can't understand what the decision tree is doing. He asked if anyone has any. Explainable machine learning methods. To simplify this decision tree. Three or four years have passed and. No one answered this question. 
if someone sees it, maybe you can help answer it. But on the other hand, think about this. How do you use decision trees practically? I know many students will say, when competing on Kaggle, deep learning is not the best to use. Decision tree is the best. That's the ace in the Kaggle competition. But think about it. When you are using decision trees, are you using only one decision tree? Actually not. The technique you really use is called random forest, right? The technique you use, in fact, is the result of the joint decision of many decision trees. With one decision tree, you can rely on the question and answer of each node to know how it makes the final judgment. But when you have a forest, when you have 500 decision trees, it's hard for you to know how these 500 decision trees make a judgment together. So decision tree is not the final answer. The problem of explainable machine learning is not solved, even if we have decision trees. Okay, before we dig deeper into the technique of explainable machine learning, another question here is, what is the goal of explainable machine learning? In each of our previous assignments, we all have a leaderboard. That means we have a clear goal, either lower the error rate or improve accuracy. We always have a clear goal. But what exactly is the goal of being explainable? What result can be considered as the best explanation? The goal of explanation is actually very ambiguous. Because the goal is not clear, you will find out that the homework on explainable machine learning does not have a leaderboard. Because there's no leaderboard, we can only use multiple choice questions to let everyone learn some knowledge. We can only do so much. But what is the ultimate goal of explainable machine learning? What is the best explanation? The following is my personal opinion. This doesn't mean it is right. You may not agree with me. And I won't argue with you. This is just my personal opinion. Many people have a misunderstanding about explainable machine learning. They think a good explanation should tell us what the model is doing in its entirety. We need to understand everything about the model. We need to know what it is. We have to fully understand how it makes a decision. But think about it. Is this really necessary? We say because machine learning's model, a deep network, is a black box. We can't trust it. However, there are so many black boxes in the world. By your side, isn't the human brain also a black box? We don't know exactly how the human brain works. Yet we can trust a decision made by another person. The human brain is also a black box. And you can trust the human brain to make a decision. Why when the black box is a deep network, you can't trust? The decisions made by it? Why are you so scared of deep networks? I think for people, if we want to be reassured, if we can accept it, reasons are very important. The following is a psychology experiment, completely unrelated to machine learning. This experiment was done in the 1970s by a Harvard University professor named Ellen Langer. This experiment is very famous. The experiment is like this it is an experiment related to printers. The printer in the Harvard University Library often has a long queue. Many people are queuing to print. At this time, if someone tells the person in front of him, please let me print first. I just need to print five pages. Would people accept it? Will they let him print first? 60% of people will let this person print first. So it feels like the students at Harvard are pretty nice. This acceptance level is higher than I expected. You told someone to let you print first. 60% of people will say yes. But this time, if you change the wording of the question, you only said if you could let me print first previously. Now, you say, can you let me print first? I'm in a rush. Whether he is really in a rush, no one knows. But when you have a reason, and ask others to let you print first, the acceptance rate becomes 94% now. In addition, even if you slightly change your reason. For example, some people ask you to let him print first because he has to make copies. Even with this reason, the acceptance rate also becomes 93%. It is interesting that people just need a reason. Why do you want to print first? You just have to give a reason. Even if your reason is that you have to make copies, everyone will accept. Is explainable machine learning the same as it? That's why we need explainable machine learning. This is my definition of a good explanation. If there is an explanation that is acceptable for everyone, then it is a good explanation. People just need a reason to make themselves happy. And who do we want to make happy? This person may be your client. Because hearing that, 
Deep network is a black box. We'll make him feel bad. But if you tell him that it is explainable and give him a reason, he will be happy. Also, he might be your boss. The boss may read a lot from content farms and thinks that deep learning is a black box which is not good. If you tell him that it is explainable, he would also be happy. Or today, you want to convince yourself. You think that it is a black box. Deep network is a black box. You can't go over. If it can give you a reason of its decision, you will be happy. So I think a good explanation is an explanation that makes everyone happy. That is a good explanation. Actually, you will find that in many researches. When we are designing these methods, it is similar to what I just talked about. A good explanation is an explanation that makes everyone happy. This idea is quite similar to the progress of this technology. So the goal of explainable machine learning is like what I just said, which is giving us a reason. We could divide explainable machine learning into two categories. The first category is called local explanation. The second category is called global explanation. Local explanation is like this. Suppose we have an image classifier. We give it a picture and it says that it is a cat. Then the question we want to ask or the machine has to answer is the reason why this picture is a cat. If it answers questions based on a certain picture, it is called local explanation. There is another category, which is global explanation. Global examination is like this. Without giving any picture to classifier, we want to know that. For a classify, what kind of picture will be classified as a cat? We are not using any specific image. To analyze, we want to know that. When we have a model, which has a lot of parameters. For these parameters, what kind of object is called a cat? So there are two categories of explainable machine learning. Let's look at the first category. The first category is asking that. Why you think this image is a cat? We can ask this question. More specifically, give the machine a picture. And when it say it was a cat, which component makes the model think it is a cat? Are they the eyes? Or the ear? Maybe cat's feet. Make the machine think it saw a cat. Or speak more generally. Suppose the input of our model is called X. This X may be an image or some texts. An X can be split into multiple components from X1 to Xn. For an image, each component could be a pixel. And for text, each component could be a word or a token. Then the question we want to ask is, inside these tokens, inside these components, it is a token for texts. And for an image, it may be a pixel. Inside these components, which one is the most important? For the machine to make the final decision. So how to know the importance of a component? The basic principle is like this. We select each of the components and modify them or delete them. If we modifying or deleting a component, make the output of network change dramatically. It shows that this component is critical. It is important. If a component was deleted, the output of network has changed dramatically. The phenomenon represents that this component is necessary to the network. Then, this component is an important component. To be more specific, if we want to know the importance of each area in the picture, there is a very simple approach to deal with it. We input a picture to the network and the network recognize this as a Pomeranian. Next, in this picture, when we put this gray square in different positions, your network will output different results. Look at this picture. These colors represents that the probability of network outputting Pomeranian. The blue color means the probability of Pomeranian is high. Oh, I was wrong. Blue color means the probability of Pomeranian is low. Red color means the probability of Pomeranian is high. And every position here represents that we put the gray square there. In other words, when we moving the gray square to the position of Pomeranian's face, your image classifier today, do not think that the picture is related to Pomeranian. If you put the gray square around the Pomeranian, at this time, the machine recognize it as a Pomeranian. So we know that the model do not recognize Pomeranian by the ball or the pattern of floor or the pattern of wall. So the model recognize Pomeranian by the pattern of the dog's face. There is also the same example here. We move the gray square on this picture. You will find that when the gray square moved to position of the tire, the machine cannot recognize the tires. 
so the machine really knows what the pattern of the tire looks like. For this phenomenon, we know that the model correctly recognized tire by the corresponding pattern of the tire. The model do not just guess the current answer, but it knows that the pattern of tire appears in this position. Let's see another picture. Then, there are two people in this picture, and a Afghan hound dog. But does the machine actually recognize dog by the pattern of the Afghan hound? Or it recognize dog by the pattern of people? At this time, you can put this gray box. Slide over this picture. Then you find that when we put this gray box on this person's face, the machine still feels it has seen the Afghan hound dog. But when you put the gray box in this position, the machine feels that it did not see the Afghan hound dog. So it really recognize Afghan hound dog by the corresponding pattern of Afghan hound dog. It knows that this pattern is related to Afghan hound dog. It do not misunderstand the pattern of people as the Afghan hound dog. So this is the simplest approach to know the importance of component. Okay, there is a more advanced method. It need to calculate gradient. Suppose we have a picture. We write it as x1 to xn. Every x here represents a pixel. Next, let's calculate the loss of this picture. We use symbol of lowercase e here. This symbol of lowercase e is that the distance of ground truth and the prediction of model when we input this picture. The distance is related to cross entropy. The bigger the e is, the worse the model prediction becomes now. Okay, so, now how to know the importance of a certain pixel in the image recognition task? Then you can input the value of a certain pixel and change the value a lit. We add a delta x on the value. Then, we can see how much does our loss value change. If you making a small change on the certain pixel today, loss value has a huge change. It means that this pixel is important for image recognition task. Otherwise, if delta x is added, this delta e approaches zero. It means that the pixel in this position is not important for the image recognition task. Then, we can use the ratio of delta e to delta x to represent the importance of pixel xn. In fact, the meaning of the term delta e divided by delta x is to do partial differentiation of xn on your loss. It is OCOT if you don't know what partial differentiation is. Anyway, the ratio of delta x to delta e represents the importance of this xn. The greater the ratio is, the more important xn is. Then, we calculate the ratio of every pixel in the picture. So, we get a new picture which represent through the ratio value. And we called this picture saliency map. It is also in our homework. You will have many opportunities to draw all kinds of saliency map. So the pictures at the bottom are the saliency maps of the corresponding pictures above. On this map, a wider point indicates a larger ratio. That is, the pixel at this position is more important. For example, when the machine is given this buffalo picture, it doesn't see the grass, nor the bamboo, but sees the most important part, which is the buffalo, and it is able to identify the correct position of the buffalo. It thinks that the pixels corresponding to the white points are the most important in deciding the type of animal in the picture. Then, by the shape of the points, it outputs buffalo as the answer. If the machine sees this picture, said it saw a monkey. Where is the monkey? Monkey is on the treetop. It does not identify the leaves as monkeys. It knows what appears at this position is its criterion for judging the correct answer. I give it this picture and it knows a dog, appeared in this position. So, this is the saliency map technique. Let me show you a practical application of it. This application is related to Pokemon and Digimon. I don't know if you guys know what that Digimon is. The one on the left is Pokemon, and the one on the right is called Digimon. Please raise your hand now if you know Digimon. Wow, that's actually a lot. Good, hands down so I don't need to explain. For classmates who don't know Digimon, it's just another animal anyway. Hey, I'm not lying. Pokemon and Digimon are just different kinds of animals. So one day when I was surfing the internet, I came across a classifier for Digimon and Pokemon with very high accuracy. So I decided to do this experiment myself to see why the model achieved such a high accuracy. You can go online to find a Pokemon gallery. 
and a Digimon gallery. So you end up with a bunch of Pokemon pictures and Digimon pictures and you want to classify them. This should not be a problem for you now, right? This is simply binary classification. Just randomly use any model you like. To train a classifier, you can just modify the code of homework 3. Simply change the number of categories. From 11 to 2. That's it. Of course, you have to test the model. With pictures that the machine hasn't seen before. So you can't use all the pictures you found. For training, you have to save some of them. For the testing set. To see whether your model can obtain the correct answer. Let's first see if humans can answer correctly. Everyone, do you think this is a Pokemon or a Digimon? If you think it is a Pokemon, raise your hand. Okay, hands down. Now raise your hand if you think it's a Digimon. Good, hands down. Honestly, I don't know the answer either. As you can see, Pokemon and Digimon are hard to distinguish. It is even hard for human beings like you to determine whether the picture is a Pokemon or a Digimon. How about the machine's performance? Okay, here we have a casually trained model with only a few layers. Let's train it. Wow, the training accuracy is 98.9%. This is very high. But don't be happy too early. This might be overfitting. Maybe the model only memorized the training data and is unable to generalize further. Because we only have a few thousand pictures for both Digimon and Pokemon. So there might be overfitting. Let's test it with the testing set. The correct rate is 98.4. This is incredible. All hail the powerful machine learning. Humans can't identify the difference between Pokemon and Digimon, but the machine can with 98.4% correct rate. Then you might be curious about the criterion the machine used to answer the question. That is, how it found the difference between Pokemon and Digimon. So let's draw a saliency map. There are a few animals here. Actually, they are Digimons. Next, I will sketch the saliency map of those pictures. With the map, the machine will tell me why it thinks these are Digimons. The answer given by the machine is like this. The brighter points here are the important potters identified by the machine. This is a little bit weird. It seems that the bright dots are distributed in the four corners. I don't know what happened. Next, I will analyze Pokemon. The issue is more obvious. You find that the features, which machine cares about, are basically away from the Pokemon's body. It's all on the background of the image. Why is it? Because. The images of Pokemon are all PNG files. And the images of Digimon are all JPEG files. After the PNG file is read in, the background will be all black. So, the machine only needs to look at the background. To know if a picture is a Pokemon or a Digimon. It's solved like this. Great. So, this example tells us that. Explainable AI is a very important technology. You may feel a little bit ridiculous about the example I just gave to you. Maybe, it won't happen in regular applications. But, will it really not happen? There is a real example. There is a benchmark corpus. Called Pascal VOC 2007. There are all kinds of objects inside. Machine needs to learn to classify images. When the machine sees this picture. It knows it's a picture of a horse. But, if you draw saliency map. You will realize the result like this. It only cares about the lower left corner of the horse. Why? Because that there is a string of English in the lower left corner. Pictures of horses in this gallery are from a certain website. And the lower left corner of them all have the same string of English. So, when the machine sees this string of English in the lower left corner, it will know it is a horse. It doesn't have to learn what a horse looks like. So, in this real application today, on benchmark corpus, a similar situation will occur. So, it tells us that this explainable machine learning technique is very important. Okay, is there any method to draw saliency map for explainable machine learning better? The first method is the smooth grad just mentioned by the TAs. What does it mean? This picture refers to a gazelle. Then, you expect that when you are doing saliency map, the machine will focus on the gazelle. If you use the method we just mentioned to draw the saliency map directly, 
the result you get may look like this. Indeed, there are many bright spots near the gazelle. But there are also some noises in other places. To make people look a little uncomfortable. So, there is the smooth grad method. Smooth grad will make your saliency map. With few noises. If, on this example, you will find out that most of the bright spots concentrate on the gazelle. How does the smooth grad method work? It's very simple. To put it bluntly, it's worthless. It's that, on your picture, you add various noises. Pictures with different noises mean different pictures. On each picture, we calculate the saliency map. Then, if you have 100 kinds of noises to add, there will be 100 saliency maps. By averaging them, you can get the result of smooth grad. That's it. Of course, someone might ask that. How you know this smooth grad must give better result than the original one. Maybe, for the machine. It really thinks these grasses are very important. It really thinks this sky is very important. It really thinks this background is very important. Maybe. It's like what I said at the beginning. The most important goal of explainable machine learning is just to make people feel good. When you draw this picture, your boss will feel unpleasant. He will feel that this model is a little bit suck. This model seems to be hard to explain. So, you will draw it as smooth grad like this. And then tell others that. Please look at this model. It really knows the gazelle is the most important. So, this model is good. And, this explainable machine learning method is also good. Good, but, actually by just looking at gradient, it could not fully reflect the importance of a component. How should I say? Here is an example for your reference. Okay. This horizontal axis represents the length of the nose of elephant or a certain creature. The vertical axis represents the probability that this creature is an elephant. We all know the characteristic of elephants is long nose. So, for a creature, the longer its nose, the more likely it is an elephant. But, when its nose is long enough to a limitation, making it even longer won't make it more like an elephant. Elephant with long nose is just an elephant with a very long nose. So, when an elephant's nose gets longer, beyond a certain range, you won't think it becomes more like an elephant. So, the length of a creature's nose is irrelevant to the possibility that it is an elephant. Its relevance may be at first when the length is relatively short. As the length gets longer, there is a growing possibility that this creature is an elephant. But, when the length of the nose reaches a certain level, even longer nose, won't make it more like an elephant. At this time, if you calculate the length of the nose, and do the partial differential of the probability of an elephant, the partial differential you get in this place, might approximate to zero. So if you only look at gradient, and only look at the saliency map, you may come to a conclusion that, the length of the nose, has nothing to do with whether it's an elephant or not. The length of the nose is not an indicator of whether it is an elephant. Because the change in the length of the nose, with respect to changes in the possibility of being an elephant, is close to zero, so the nose is not an important indicator for judging whether it is an elephant at all. Is it reasonable? Actually you know it's not like this. So if we only look at gradient, and the results of partial differentiation, it may not tell us completely the importance of a component. Hence, there are other ways. There is a method called integrated gradient. Its abbreviation is called IG. Here, I'm not going to elaborate on how IG works. We just leave the file here. There is also an IG implemented in the teaching assistance program. Then if you are interested, you can study by yourself to see how IG works. If you are not interested, then you press enter, and you get the result of the IG analysis. Okay. Just now we were looking at network. We just looked at an input. And tell which parts of it are more important. Then the next question we have to ask is. When we show an input to network. How does it handle this input? How does it process the input? And got the final answer? Okay, there are different ways. The first method is most intuitive. You see. What happened in network with your own eyes. In the homework. I want you to see what happened in BERT. That is related to text. For the example given in class, let's take the voice, for example. In homework 2, you have trained a network. This network is just inputting a short piece of sound. 
and judging that this voice is belong to which phoneme and which kk phonetic and then suppose your first layer has 100 neurons the second layer also has 100 neurons the output of the first layer can be seen as a 100 dimensional vector the output of the second layer can also be seen as a 100 dimensional vector by analyzing these vectors maybe we can know that what happened in a network but a 100 dimensional vector is not easy to read not easy to observe and not easy to analyze so what to do you have many ways you can take a 100 dimensional vector and reduce it to two dimensions then what is the method we won't go into details here in short there is a basket of methods that can be used after reducing the 100 dimension to two dimensions you can draw on the picture then you can observe it carefully see what you can observe the following are examples of voice then this example comes from a paper in 2012 you will find hinton the father of deep learning is also the author of this article what does this article do this article to be honest this article is your homework too do you know that it is exactly the same as the data you used for homework too so suppose you travel through time and space to 10 years ago you show hinton the result of your homework too he would be shocked you can tell him that by the way. This is just one of our 15 assignments. He was shocked. You can also tell him that. Oh for this one. I only train for an hour and then the train is finished. At that time training something like this. You have to train for more than a week. Then Hinton would be shocked. So seeing these past articles. I really can only say that. The era has changed. How troublesome it is to train network used to be. Now the era have really changed. In fact, Deep Beliefs Network was used at that time. Is Deep Belief Network a deep neural network? Not like this. What is this? We won't talk about it. Because no one is using this thing anymore. Okay, but the result it got is still worth seeing today. Actually in homework too, you should be possible to observe similar results. Okay, what are you doing here? What we are doing here is we get the input of the model first which is the acoustic feature, which is MFCC. Then we reduce it to two dimensions and draw on a two-dimensional plane. On this picture, each point represents a small sound signal. Every color represents a speaker, someone who speaks. In fact, the information we threw to this network has many sentences repeated. Someone said, A said how are you. B also said how are you. C also said how are you. Many people said the same sentence. But you can't tell from this picture. From the acoustic feature, we can see that. The same sentence with the same content. Spoken by different people. Cannot be told apart. Sentences spoken by the same person were more similar to each other. Even if it's the same sentence. As long as it's spoken by different people. The results won't be aligned. So, judging from this result. People will think that. Voice recognition is too difficult to be done, since the features of the same sentence spoken by different people looks very different from one another. How is the task of voice recognition possible to be done? Things are different when we look at the middle layers of the network. This is the output of the eighth layer of the network. What can we see? We can see that there are many lines, each with no specific color. What do the lines here represent? Each one represents a certain sentence of the same content. So, we can see that. The same sentence spoken by different people. Cannot be told apart on MFCC. After it passes through the eighth layer of the network. The machine knows that these sentences have the same content. Although the audio signal looks different. Because it was spoken by different people. They have the same content. It can align sentences with the same content. That were spoken by different people. Together. So, we can get accurate classification results in the end. Okay, we just talked about directly analyzing the output of the neurons. We can also analyze the attention layer. Self-attention is widely used nowadays. And we can also see what the network actually learned by looking at the result of the attention. In the homework, we also asked you guys to take a look at Bert's attention. But, when you decide to use attention, there are still things that you need to pay attention to. Intuitively, you think that attention should be very explanatory. The attention should show us how much some words are related. 
In the homework, we also picked some examples that show relevance more obviously for everyone to implement. However, we can actually find papers like this one. Attention is not explanation. Attention isn't always explainable. Of course, some people have published papers like this one. Attention is not not explanation. So, we can see that this field of research is progressing very fast. Soon, maybe someone will publish a paper claiming attention is not 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 explanation. So, the questions of whether attention is explainable or not, when is it explainable, or when is it not explainable, are still problems that require further research. In addition to observing with human eyes, there is another technology called probing. Probing means using probes to probe into the network and see what happens. For example, suppose now we want to know what a certain layer of BERT has learned. Observing with the naked eye has its limits. There may be many phenomena that we didn't observe. Besides, there is no way for us to look through a large amount of data at once. So, what should we do? We can train a probe. The probe is actually a classifier. For example, we train a classifier that decides the POS tag of a phrase, which is its part of speech, according to a feature, which is a vector. We pass the embedding of BERT to the POS classifier. To train the POS classifier, it will try to use these embeddings to decide the parts of speech of the embeddings. If the POS classifier has a high accuracy, it means that there's a lot of information regarding the parts of speech of the embeddings. If the POS classifier has a low accuracy, it means that there isn't much information regarding the parts of speech of the embeddings. Or, you train ANER classifier, which stands for name entity recognition. Then, it determines whether the vocabulary it sees now is a name for a person, a name for a place, or not a proper noun at all. Through the accuracy of the NER classifier, we can know whether these features contain names, addresses, or any information about the person's name, etc. However, there's one thing you have to be careful with when using this technique. What is it? Be careful with the strength of the classifier you're using. Why is that? Suppose your classifier has a very low accuracy. Is it guaranteed that these features that we input, which are the embeddings of BERT, contain no information that we want to classify? Not necessarily. Why is that? Because it's possible that your classifier wasn't trained correctly. Right? You all have a lot of experience with training networks. And we know we can't guarantee the classifier to be trained successfully. Perhaps, the accuracy of the classifier is very low after training. It's not owing to these features, which don't contain the information we need, but the learning rate which wasn't adjusted properly. Perhaps there's a mistake somewhere along the line that made the training fail. Could that be the case? It might be, sometimes. So, when using the probing model, you have to be careful not to jump to conclusions too quickly. Sometimes you will get some conclusions just because your classifier is not well trained, or your model is so good that the accuracy of your classifier cannot be treated as a basis for judgment. Okay, I know this class will be over soon. Time really flies. We have finished talking about a special probing example of voice and then end the class. The probing model does not have to be a classifier. I will give you an example that probing has all kinds of possibilities. For example, one attempt in our laboratory is to train a speech synthesis model. The input of general speech synthesis models is a paragraph of text and the model output the corresponding sound signal. The input of our speech synthesis model is not a paragraph of text. Its input is the embedding of the network output. It takes embedding of network output as input and then tries to output a sound signal. In homework 2, you trained a classifier. You trained a phoneme classifier. We will take out your network, get the output of a certain layer, and input it to the TTS model. To train this TTS model, the goal of our training is to make the TTS model have the ability to reproduce the network input. The input of the network is this audio signal. I hope that it can generate embeddings. After passing these layers, after inputting the embeddings to TTS, it can restore the original sound signal. What is the use of such an analysis? You might want to say that 
We train this TTS to generate the original sound signal, which is the same as the original sound signal, the one it inputs. Why? The interesting part here is that, assuming this network is to remove information, such as the speaker, for this TTS model, the output of layer 2 has no speaker information, no matter how hard it tries. It cannot restore the characteristics of the speaker. Although the content is high with a boy's voice, you will find that, maybe after a few layers, the output of the TTS model, which is the sound it produces, will become high, but you can't tell who said it. You can know that this network, a model for speech recognition, learned to erase the characteristics of the speaker. In the process of training, it keeps the content. It only keeps the content of the audio signal. The following is a real example. After finishing this example, we will dismiss the class. Okay, this example looks like this. There is a five-layer bi-directional LSTM. Its input is the sound signal. The output is text. It is a model of speech recognition. Now, we give it a sound signal as input. It's a girl's voice. Next, let it listen to another content. With a boy's voice. It sounds like this. Next, we put these sound signals into this network. Then put the embedding of this network into the TTS model to restore the original sound signal. Let's see what we hear. The following is the result of the first layer of LSTM. You will find that the sound signal is a bit distorted, but basically the same as before. The boy's voice is like this. It is the same as before. But what happens after passing the fifth layer of LSTM? The sound signal becomes like this. So originally a sentence was spoken by a boy and a sentence is spoken by a girl. After passing the fifth layer of LSTM, I can't tell who said it. It makes the voices of two people become the same. You might say, Hinton already knows it. Ten years ago, through visualization. What's great about this research? The greatness of this research is that it is trendy. We can listen to the voice heard by the network. Here is one last example. The input audio signal is noisy. with piano sound. Okay, our network now has several layers of CNN in front. There are several layers of bi-directional LSTM behind. After passing through the first CNN layer, the sound signal becomes like this. You can still hear the piano. The sound in the last layer, before the LSTM layer, is like this. You still hear the piano, but after passing the first layer LSTM, it's different. It sounds like this. You will find that the piano's voice suddenly became much lower. So know that the noise of this piano, which is the noisy sound signal, is filtered out on the first layer of LSTM. The CNN layers in front do not seem to play a role in filtering out the noise. This is what this analysis can tell us. Okay, we just end here. Let's dismiss the class. If you have any questions, you can stay and discuss them. Thank you all. Thank you.